Thanks for joining us for Parenting for Recovery in Your Young Adult Who is Struggling. As we're getting started, I'd like to thank our friends at Methodist Service for reaching out and asking us to present this training today. We have a lot to cover, so I'll just say that the Parent Alliance supports parents of children with mental health challenges to be their child's best advocate. And just like a parent, support doesn't stop once a child turns 18, neither does ours. We're here for parents no matter the age of their child. Our services can be provided virtually, so we cover the entire state of Pennsylvania, and currently, thanks to our generous donors, have no restrictive criteria such as income, insurance, or location. So we'll be discussing what changes when your child becomes a legal adult. We'll learn how we can support a mental health recovery model. We'll talk about focusing on what we can control, positive parenting approaches to young adult children, and responding effectively to problem behavior. Now look, this can be hard for parents who were raised in a more authoritarian home to accept some of these ideas, and it may help to keep in mind that our children have grown up in the information and digital age when they can access lots of information and resources and, and click off at any moment. So continuing to act the same way we did when they were younger may help us win a battle here and there, but we can end up losing the war. And we'll say, though, the fact that you're here really shows that you're willing to learn and adapt. So hopefully you can take an idea or two and put it into practice. <laughs> now, this is probably a bit of a rhetorical slide, but true or false, when a child turns 18, their parents still have legal authority over them. Uh, clearly, that's false. Once a child turns 18, they're legal adults. They can do whatever they want, and parents have no legal authority over them. They'll learn to face consequences of their choices, and unfortunately, they can choose to have a relationship with their parents or not. Now, we may not have legal authority over them, but our behavior can influence what they choose. Now, okay, having said that we have no legal authority over them, there, there are some exceptions, such as if they've designated us power of attorney, if we've gone to court and gotten guardianship, or if we petition for an involuntary commitment. Otherwise, again, no legal authority to make, make being the keyword, them do anything. And that includes what probably scares us the most deciding if they want treatment or not, and whether they agree to share a release of information so that their treating professionals can give us information about them. So I guess the question is, what worries you about your child becoming a legal adult? And I'd encourage you to spend a few minutes to write down for yourself what it is that really worries you the most. I'll tell you that you're not alone if you're worried that they'll stop or refuse treatment, that they won't sign that release form so we know what's going on, and then you'll be out of the loop wondering what's happening. You're not alone if you're worried that they'll make dangerous or unhealthy choices, that they won't be able to be independent enough to live separately, or that they'll be taken advantage of. Look, these are all valid concerns that come out of love and caring. Now, there is another side of the coin, though. Let's take a second to think about what you like best about your child becoming an adult. Now, often we hear that parents are excited that maybe they'll get along better with their child because their child has that autonomy. Parents enjoy the freedom of being able to come and go as they like, even if there's some limits with that. And some parents are a bit hesitant to say, but when we talk one-on-one, -on -one, they say that they're really eager for their now adult child to see all that's been given to them that they probably didn't even realize and maybe they didn't appreciate. Now, adults with mental health challenges worldwide have advocated for what's called the mental health recovery model. And this two-minute video out of Ireland captures the key principles of what adults say helps them recover. 
In Ireland, the health service executive mental health services vision is that recovery is a reality for all. So what does that actually mean? Well, anyone can experience mental health challenges. The good thing is people can and do recover. So how does a serious mental health challenge affect a person? Well, it may impact on their ability to carry out normal everyday tasks. It may be difficult to form or maintain relationships, find or hold down a job, make friends, and be part of the community. It can be a very lonely place as they may have experiences that others just don't understand. So what is mental health recovery? First of all, it's personal. Recovery is as unique as you are. It's about living a good life with or without symptoms. It's about what you can do, not what you can't. It can be a journey for some and a destination for others. And it's not always easy, but with the right supports, recovery is easy. Evidence suggests that recovery is best supported by five things. Just remember the word child. C stands for connections having good relationships with other people. H is for hope and the belief that you can recover. I is for identity, having a positive sense of yourself. M represents finding your own meaning and purpose in life. Finally, E is for empowerment, focusing on your strengths and having control over your life. That's China. Now, if this recovery model is new to you or to your family, you could consider sharing this video with your young adult. There's a way to do this, which we cover in our training called how to give information to your teens or young adults so they can hear it. So here's one of the tips we offer. When you have information that you'd like to provide, start by asking your child if they'd be interested in some information you have to share and then accept their answer no matter what it is. Sure, that sounds simple enough. The conversation may go something like this. Hey, Bobby, I just learned about this mental health recovery model. Have you heard about it? If you're interested, I can send you the link. It was under two minutes. And then pause. Would it be okay if I sent it to you? Now, if you think about it, it's very similar to how you would offer advice to a colleague at work um, if maybe they needed some help to do their job a little bit better, but you didn't have any authority over them, but you kind of saw them going down a, a path where, where this would help. So here's a breakdown of the CHIME model for recovery as it was just presented. Connectedness, hope, identity, meaning, and empowerment. As parents, we can really play a part when allowed in that connectedness area. And even with or without permission, we can be key to empowerment as we prepare our children for adulthood. Now, the remainder of the webinar will incorporate ways that parents can help their young adults experience these elements of recovery in their relationship. So here we go. The tips will we'll be discussing can get very positive results, but they're not easy. They require us to have strength, which takes self-control, self-discipline, a lot of self-care and support for us. So tip one, honor your children as adults with these three messages. I love you no matter what, and even if. If you have questions or need my counsel, ask me. And good luck. It's your life and you're now driving it. Now, number one is really just an affirmation that your love is unconditional. There will be times when you disagree or disapprove of their actions, but you're still going to love them. Number two is that you'll be there if they need you and you're going to do your best to wait until you're asked. And number three is that they're in the driver's seat, but you're always there wishing them well through the good and the bad. Tip two, 
understand that they want freedom and control, and you can assist them in getting that freedom and control. But freedom is not free. Now, that is a tough bit that you're not going to be able to teach them. That's the world's job. With freedom comes responsibility. We all have to learn it. No, we don't want our children to suffer. But this is sometimes a lesson that's best learned through living. If you forget to set your alarm clock or you don't wake up when it goes off and you miss your therapy appointment, you're going to have to wait six weeks to get back on their calendar. If you don't drop off the deposit check for your classes, you don't get the classes you need or you want. There's really nothing that a parent can do to fix this situation. I love tip three. If they live with you, discuss rent. Now, rent can be the thing that gives them that control over their space. It doesn't have to be money. And you can really use it to be something that can improve their life. So you can say, while you're going to classes, you can live here for free. While you're doing some volunteer work to get experience, you can live here for free. Or for the first three months that you work, I'm not going to ask you for rent so that you have money to set aside for a car or car insurance or work clothes, whatever the case may be. Now, again, it can also be something like while you're going to therapy and you're on medication, you don't have to pay, pay rent. Um, but then you can also ask them to take on certain household chores instead of cash, giving you money. Um, I'd like for you to do a dinner every Monday night, and I'd like for you to uh, pick up the groceries that I order, right? Whatever it is that you decide, um, it's, it's important that they contribute to the household and have control over their own space. Now, don't wait until they're 18 to discuss this. Start laying that groundwork early so they don't feel trapped or they're not surprised. Write up a simple contract spelling out what they'll do and what you'll do and have everyone sign it and get a copy, just like a landlord. Now, they may say you're being overly harsh or silly, and don't be surprised if you hear that from friends and family too. But you're really respecting them as independent adults by being very clear about what they get and what you expect. As Brene Brown says, clear is kind. Now, now, tip four is definitely my nemesis. Don't give unsolicited advice. Give counsel when asked. Don't tell them what to do. Instead, you can act like that trusted advisor. Say things like, I'm not totally sure what will work best for you in this situation, but in my experience, now, now this is really hard because for the last dozen years, we've had to teach our children, which involved us giving advice and fixing things. It was our job. It's a definite shift and we're not expecting anyone to be able to make a change overnight. But here's a great reminder for all of us. Instead of fixing things or giving advice instantly, stop, simply listen, empathize, and then you can ask, how do you feel about this? How do you think you should handle this? And here's a good one. How can I support you? Now, just do your best and practice, and you could try it with anyone in your life. Remember to give yourself grace. If you forget and launch into giving advice or fixing mode, try again next time. And don't forget to apply this same grace to our children as they're trying and learning new things too. So here's a couple more messages that can honor them as adults. There's many things that I like and appreciate about you. I want to make being around me a positive experience, whether you live with me or not. Now, this can be harder than it sounds, especially if you believe your child isn't doing what they need to do to be healthy. In that case, if your child isn't living with you, keep your visit short or plan to do them around an activity so you have something else to focus on and visit sooner than you want while things are going well. And here's a big tip on how to communicate with your adult child 
if you're just getting started and things are a little rocky or you know if you're just not not sure what things are going great and you're you're still not sure act as if your adult child is a colleague and you're interacting with them in a professional environment now this guidance is based on the assumption that unpleasant coercive interactions only make our adult children want to avoid us escape get even or counter coerce us now this certainly isn't always the case Many families of adult children with mental health challenges or in recovery have wonderful relationships with their children. So it's possible, but sometimes things get a little dicey and we may feel like we're at odds with our children. So again, we're going to act like our children are work colleagues. So some things to do, just be pleasant, smile, make your home a happy place, shoot the breeze, if we make their time with us negative and unpleasant and an unpleasant experience, what are they likely to do? Avoid us or in every interaction, expect that things are going to be adversarial and unpleasant. And maybe they'll preemptively act as if that's the case, which will create a vicious cycle. So research shows us that stressful interactions, and that includes stressful interactions with us, can partially contribute to a relapse in disorders like schizophrenia, bipolar, and depression. Okay, so some tips for those positive interactions. Give respect to get respect. Ask positive open questions. State your point and stop. Reflect back their position. Empathize with their challenges. Validate their feelings is understandable, even if you don't agree with their position. Now remember, getting into arguments is counterproductive. Your young adult will remember more what they said than what, what, than what you said. It strengthens their position rather than opening them up to what you're saying if, if we're, we're being adversarial. They're more likely to listen to us and respect us if they feel us listening to and respecting them. Making reflective statements that validate your child is having painful feelings or struggling does not mean you're, you support what they're doing. So let's look at an example of how that would work. 20-year-old Jason tells his father, Tom, he's thinking of quitting school. Tom respectfully asks, so what's happening that you're thinking of quitting? Tom listens without interrupting and then says, wow, sounds like you've been having a terrible time with the professors and the other students. Sounds really hard. I understand why you're so upset and thinking of quitting. It's a big decision, son. Jason interrupts and says, I don't need any lectures. And Tom stops himself and says, hey, I'm going to respect that. I'm here if you want to talk about it, and I'm not going to give advice unless you want it. So Tom respectfully asked a positive and open question. He reflected back what he heard. He empathized with Jason's difficulties and validated that Jason was upset. He made a point, and when he got pushed back, he stopped himself. Then he offered counsel without further coercive behavior even though it took a lot of self-control and self-discipline because it was upsetting to think his son was making such an extreme decision that could negatively affect his future. So something else, show curiosity, ask open questions. In example two, we have 22-year-old Hank who promised his parents he would get into therapy so he could work on his anger issues and do better at holding a job so he could get his own apartment. While having dinner with his parents one night, he announced that he had left a message for two therapists over a week ago and hadn't heard back. Both of his parents resisted the urge to ask what he planned to do next. Instead, his mom, Helen, said, I appreciate that you got up the courage to call and leave messages, and it's frustrating that they haven't called back. A few days later, she asked, how's it going with the therapist search? And he said, no callbacks. So I guess I need to call the others on that list. I'll, I'll do that. So she replied, 
I appreciate your persistence. So Helen gave what we call clean praise. She showed empathy. She gave validation. Then she waited a few days and she asked an open question. So here's clean praise. Praise and appreciation should be honest, accurate, simply stated. You don't have to do it every time, but you should do it often. And you could positively reinforce positive behavior in ways beyond a praise, a hug, a high five, a pat on the back, thumbs up, a special meal, or some other kind of treat. Doesn't have to be a big deal. So here we have 19-year-old Cynthia living with her mom, Janice. They made an agreement that Cynthia's rent would be cleaning the bathroom and the kitchen weekly, taking out the garbage when the kitchen garbage can gets full or smelly. Cynthia told her mom she cleaned the bathroom, and even though Janice had just taken a shower, didn't really look clean. So Janice thanked Cynthia for working to honor her side of the agreement about rent cleaning the bathroom. And later on in the day, Janice respectfully said to Cynthia, Hey, I noticed there's still some spots in the shower that look dirty. Would you please take a look and squirt them with some of that bathroom spray? Maybe they were harder stains. Thanks, hon. So Janice gave clean praise about Cynthia saying she cleaned the bathroom, and she saved her request for a later conversation when she made just a non-critical request. All right, so here's some practice for you. 21-year-old Tess has made a casserole for her dad and her 16-year-old brother, with whom she's been living since losing her last job. She tells them dinner is ready, and even though the table isn't set, uh, even though the table isn't set and the kitchen is a mess. So based on that situation, which of the following responses would be the most positive? Thanks for making dinner, but I'd appreciate it if you'd clean up after yourself. Thanks for making dinner. Smells good. I guess I'll have to set the table. Or it's nice that you're finally pitching in. Now, thinking about when I make dinner, I would say the best answer is thanks for making dinner. (laughs) Right? According to a positive parenting approach, that's exactly what we want to say. Uh, A and C, they're not clean praise. And D is sarcastic and it's critical. So B is just that clean praise. Thanks for making dinner. And if you want to, you can say, hey, I'm going to help out. Let me set the table. Or um, maybe when dinner's over, thanks, this was a great dinner. Would you like me to help you clean up? So some of the suggestions I've mentioned may have you scratching your head or mumbling, nope, I'm not doing that. I get it. This approach kind of makes can make you feel uh, like you're suddenly B&B host for our adult children, but that's not what I'm recommending. I'm certain that you've been told that the only behavior that we can change is our own behavior. Once your child becomes an adult, we can't make them take their medicine, stay away from a bad crowd or see their therapist, or work their program. So what we're encouraging you to do is to secure your place in their recovery under that letter C for connectedness. Your job now is to focus on the relationship you have with your child and secure it. It's a definite paradigm shift especially if you come from a more authoritarian background. You may have done everything for them, and now you have to stand back and wait to be asked. But right now, again, goal number one is to protect and nurture that relationship. For the longest time, we've had to be these parents, really bracing our children, holding them up and holding them very closely and guiding them. But now, as we look at our adult children's behavior, I'm going to invite you to ask, answer four questions. Is my help necessary? Instead of jumping in, stop, listen, and ask and help them figure out what they need that will help them recover. 
as parents, yeah, we're used to jumping in and taking over when our children are struggling, generally for kind-hearted reasons, to help them avoid undue hardship, because we're right there and we're capable of helping. But as our children become adults, it's our job to stand back and let them figure things out. They can always ask for help if they need it. Ask yourself, is my help encouraging? Doing for them sends a message that they're incapable. Instead, encourage them to take manageable steps. Now, many years ago, a mentor of mine said something to me that really stuck. When you do something for someone, you deny them the opportunity to learn. And whenever I'm tempted to just snatch up whatever needs to be done and do it myself, either because I'm in a hurry or because I don't have the bandwidth to stop and show someone what to do step by step, I stop and remind myself of that sentence. I don't know. For me, it just clicked. Now, I'm still not great at getting it. And my children don't often appreciate it. They just would get mad and be like, just do it for us. But if I did it for them, then they wouldn't have the opportunity to learn. Ask yourself, is my helping healthy for my child, for me, for the other relationships in my life? And ask yourself, is my helping working? If it's not, try something different. Okay, so every often we do special webinars we call conversations. These conversations are unscripted. They're generally a parent and child telling their story their way. And I'm going to share two clips with you today from a conversation we did with Liz, the mom, and Emmy, the daughter. Now, if you want to see the whole thing, it's uh, a little under an hour long, and it's available to our members on our website in the helpful resources area under webinars. So here's a clip about Liz sharing what she's learned to help herself. Um, well, over the years, I've learned to um, stop being sarcastic, um, reactive, um, learn to set boundaries, and um, have learned to ask for help. Um, the big one that I learned was that I really have no control over anything other than myself, and that can be very difficult. Um, a, a lot of time and worry can be spent trying to control things that are out of our control. And um, that was a big, big lesson for me to learn. And it's helped me tremendously. Okay, so we're going to communicate with our children like we do our colleagues. And we have some questions to ask ourselves before jumping into help. We know it's important to set boundaries. So let's look at some behavior may, we may encounter when dealing with our adult children in recovery. We're going to break unwanted behaviors into two categories, junk behavior and problem behavior. So what is junk behavior? Well, it's annoying, but it doesn't cause harm or damage. It's not serious. And again, while annoying, it do, it's tolerable to you and others in the household. So some examples, opinions or idea that differ from yours, attempts to argue with you, things you're going to forget about in like 30 minutes. So how do we deal with junk behavior? We let it go. <laughs> when my son was very young and in therapy, I mean, we're talking like eight or nine years old, his therapist taught him this skill called planned ignoring. Now, I wasn't in the room, so I only got the hallway version. And that was that you're choosing not to let the behavior get your go, push your buttons, or purposely annoy you. Now, I love this strategy. Uh, we think about it often as picking your battles, right? Is it worth aggravating yourself over? <laughs> now, I'm going to guarantee you that there are going to be some people around you who may say things like, you're going to let them talk to you like that, or you're going to let them get away with that. Well, maybe if I didn't know that my child was doing this either purposely or as a result of their disability, I wouldn't. But in this case, I'm deciding it's appropriate. 
And yes, you can absolutely use planned ignoring when someone questions how you parent. So how are we going to deal with junk behavior? Well, we're going to ignore it. Don't say anything or just change the topic. Um, don't argue. You can say, oh, I guess we see this differently. And allow your child to have last word. If you know what you want to say won't make the situation any better, don't say it. So here we go. Single mom Lorraine lives with her 19-year-old son, Jack, who withdrew from college classes. Lorraine's in the kitchen. Jack comes in, reaches in to the freezer and takes out an ice cream sandwich, looks at his mom and goes, as long as you keep on buying junk, I'm going to keep eating it. So which of these responses is the most positive if you've decided that this is junk behavior? To respond and say, when you get a job, you can buy whatever you want. Or you never answer me when I ask what you want, so you take what you get. Or why don't you do the shopping? Or say nothing. Now, now sure, his comment is rude, disrespectful. But is it worth spending your limited energy and perhaps your evening in an argument, which A, B, and C are probably going to end up causing? I'd say stick to D. Save your time and your energy for something that will be useful when dealing with junk behavior. Now, the other kind of undesirable behavior is problem behavior. Now, who does determines what problem behavior is? Well, in this case, you do. It's a problem for you happening in your home or around you. It affects you, and you can decide what's acceptable and unacceptable to you. The unacceptable is problem behavior. Now, we're going to define this as something that's intolerable to you or your household. So loud music after 10 o'clock at night staying out all night without any like updating the parent and then it that makes it hard for you to relax and sleep because you know as parents we're always envisioning the worst or maybe regularly not showing up for important family events um it's inconsistent with the values of the heads of the household so you know mom dad whoever's in charge and that can include illegal drugs or pornography in the home um, it's behavior that can lead to serious consequences or harm, either physical or psychological. So, you know, smoking in the house, punching holes in the wall, threatening harm to others, self-injury, driving while drunk. Also important to note is that you don't have to justify what you find to be problem behavior to anyone. For some families, problem behavior may seem minor and perhaps silly, and others may say, why are you being so nitpicky? But every family is different. If you want to have a, a real conversation with someone who understands those challenges, I'd invite you to reach out to a family support partner or attend a support group and kind of, you know, listen to what people say, throw it out there. But at the end of the day, problem behavior is what you define problem behavior as. There's a lot of history. You know what's best for you, your family, and your situation. So how are we going to deal with problem behavior? Well, it's best to be proactive by making a plan rather than reactive by criticizing, complaining, or making empty threats. So you'll want to sit down and decide what is um, uh, and is not a problem behavior for you and your family. And then for yourself, decide how you're going to react if these behaviors occur. We do have a whole training on setting boundaries as part of our teen and young adult parenting class, where we take time to really think things through in much more depth. But it's easy enough to decide what you'll tolerate and what you won't. Don't get too granular, but think about like big bucket things like something that compromises personal safety, the safety of the home and the belongings, or maybe moral deal breakers. So step one for handling a problem behavior is self-control. Now that's self-control for you 
the parent, remembering that we can't change anyone else's behavior besides our own. We want to make sure that we don't make empty threats or lash out. And if we sense that someone is losing control of their behavior and could cause harm to us or ourselves, we don't want to push them. Those could be cases where someone is inebriated or very explosive. And in that case, you're going to want to use de-escalation techniques. And we're not going to cover those today. But your self-control is going to be pausing, taking a, a breath so that you can stay calm and think. And then you're going to say, like, this behavior is not okay when you're around me or when you're in, in my home or in this home. And then you're going to make a plan if you haven't already. So for many problem behaviors, you'll have to be willing to tolerate the anxiety and see the benefits of allowing natural and logical consequences by not removing or softening the consequences that naturally result from their behavior. Now, this can be the most effective way teens and young adults can learn from experience how to navigate life. So an example could be, you're not going to stop what you're doing and run them to work if they woke up too late to take the bus. If they don't study, they're going to fail or take their test. If they come home inebriated, you're not going to cover a, cover for them or clean up for them. In the last slide, we talked about um, saying no loud noise after 10 o'clock. Well, let's say they're they're not paying attention and there's a knock at the door. Let them answer the door and let them talk to the police or the neighbor about the loud noise. Let them be the one to get the ticket or the fine. Now, mental health disorders can make it way more complicated since the illness may be playing a role in their behavior, but they do still need to learn responsibility. And that happens by them managing the cause, cause and effects of their behavior. So you're going to make sure that they know what you expect while they're living in your home. Explain this like when they turn 18 or have this conversation before they move back in with you after being out of your home. Put it in writing, sign it, make sure you both have copies. Again, examples could be in by midnight, making dinner on Monday, no smoking anything in the house. You really can't control what your young adult does or doesn't do, but you can decide on what you expect. And it is worth taking time to think about this and discuss these expectations with your other perhaps adult partner in the house so you could support each other and not allow your, allow your child to divide and conquer. It's really important that you're on the same page. So you're going to set a limit. You're going to explain what goods or services you're going to provide based on what your adult child does. And I mean, you could call these earned privileges if you want. It's what you could call them in your head. Remember, though, that we love our children and we want to help them. We're, but we're really, once they turn 18, we're not responsible for, for providing goods and services. So this support is a privilege, not a right. For instance, you can let them borrow the car, and if they bring it back on E, you just don't let them borrow the car again anymore, or at least for quite some time. And then before you're ready to do that again, you're going to discuss your expectations. I'm sure there's at least one person out there thinking, uh, uh, what if they just take the car? Because that's what my kid does. This happens, and unfortunately, it leaves you in a very hard place. You may feel the need to keep uh, your car keys in your bedroom or on you. Um, but also, this is really when you have to set consequences. If you take the car without my permission again, you can't live here anymore or whatever it is that you decide is appropriate. So here's the do, the do, re, me of privileges you provide. They should be doable. You can monitor the behavior and be consistent in providing or taking away that earned privilege. It's reasonable. Be fair. It's not too big or too small. And it's meaningful. It's something they want or they need. Um, and hopefully they're going to be willing to work to keep it. Now, again, if there's another adult in the house, you'll need to make sure you're both on the same page with this um, because your young adult dividing the two of you together, it's really just not good for anyone. 
So here's some examples of earned privileges. Uh, maybe you're paying for their cell phone. You'll keep them on your health insurance. You'll cook for them. You'll buy groceries. You'll babysit for free. Uh, you'll let them have a key to your house. You'll let them live with you. So how do you use adverse contingencies with your children? Now, these are something that they'll hopefully work to avoid. Well, it can include taking away any earned privileges, keys to your car, maybe help paying tuition. Um, and as new situations arise, you're going to have to create new adversive contingencies, such as the alarm system goes on at midnight. So if you're not home by then, you're going to need to find someplace else to sleep. So here's some steps to contingency planning. Choose a privilege. Again, that's doable, reasonable and meaningful, that do re me, <laughs> so you can follow through and be consistent. Communicate your plan so your adult child knows in advance what the behavior will, that behavior will result in the loss of a privilege or a new adversive contingency. Be specific. Make sure that they understand it. Um, you can ask them to repeat it back to you, but you should definitely put it in writing. Everybody can sign it. And then later on, you'll be able to pull it out so there's no gaslighting happening. No, this is what we agreed on. And then monitor the behavior and consistently enforce the contingency based on their behavior. Now, I'd advise you to be planful about this because if you let a behavior slide once, then you've taught them that you're not serious and that's really not good. There will absolutely be a time when things happen that you couldn't possibly imagine. In those cases, take a deep breath and walk away. Now, no, this isn't because you're using planned ignoring. It's buying yourself some time to think so you're not reactive. You can let them know that their behavior is unacceptable and you'll talk with them about it later. But right now you need to walk away. And then use that same process for deciding what to do. So here's some examples of contingencies. You can add privileges. When you come home sober, I'll make dinner. When you register for art class, I'll buy you the materials you need. For each week you do your tasks that we discussed, without me asking, I'll knock $50 off your rent. If you can hold a part-time job for three months, I'll co-sign on a, a lease for you. You could remove privileges. I'm going to stop paying your tuition if you don't work with a tutor to improve your grades or if you keep missing classes. Uh, I'm going to change the locks if you steal anything else from the house. The next time I find evidence that you're doing drugs in this house, I'm going to call your probation officer. Uh, if you stay out past 12 and you don't text me updates so I can sleep, you'll have to go live somewhere else, maybe with your father. Now, I knew a family where the parents owned the business and they paid their children who worked for them a bonus if they came to work every day of the week, in addition to paying their daily rate. And I mean, this was 10 years ago. It was a pretty sizable bonus. So maybe it was like $500. So if you come to work Monday through Friday, Monday through Saturday, whatever it was, every day of the week, I'm going to give you $500 in addition to, you know, your, your daily pay that you get. Now, losing that $500 really hurt. So even if they had uh, PTO to use, you know, which is fine, they were sick, they really had to think, uh, am I sick enough to not go to work? I know with this particular family, they did that to kind of dissuade their children from going out and, you know, staying out too late and then being like, oh, so what? I lose like $125. Like, I'll, I'll go to work later. No big deal. Um, I know I'm not in a position to be able to do that, but I throw it out there because people get creative. So be creative in what you can add or unfortunately in what you'll need to remove. Choosing effective contingencies takes time, thought, and buy-in from other heads of household. And I truly understand that many families are really seriously in a hard place with their children. And in those cases, these contingencies I'm talking about may be a bit laughable. 
When that happens, I'd really recommend that you reach out to an FSP and work one-on-one to come up with a plan of action specifically for your family and situation. Look, you're not alone if you get home from work and put your keys in a lockbox or a safe. So here's an example. We have 23-year-old Carl. He has bipolar disorder and borderline personality disorder. And he recently punched a hole in the kitchen wall at the apartment. So he threatened his mom, Andrea, when she told him she wouldn't give him cash. She got out safely and he was 302'd for the third time for this type of behavior. Now, she let the hospital social worker know that she wouldn't consider letting him return to live with her unless he was in a DBT program for at least four months to learn emotional regulation and anger management skills. Now, Andrea removed the privilege of living with her and made regaining it contingent on Carl completing a program that's known to be effective in helping people with borderline personality regulate their emotions. Yeah, I can guarantee this wasn't an easy decision or quick solution. And we know that right now there aren't really beds available, but especially when your safety is concerned, you really do have to put yourself first. Now, I am so grateful that Liz and Emmy shared their story with us because as a mom, I, I remember thinking and still think, will we get through this? Will we be able to be a family again? And while not every situation works out, it's always good to have hope. So here's Liz and Emmy again. I'll just say this and um, yeah, I'm just going to say it's not one of my best moments. Um, I still work through the shame and guilt with it all. Um, But there was a time where I came home and I had drugs in my purse and um, my mom was going to take my purse to look in it and immediately fight or flight mode kicks in. And I just, I just punched her in the face. I was like, you're, she wasn't in my mind in that moment. She wasn't my mom. She was somebody trying to take my drugs. And I was like, that's not fucking happening. Um, but today you probably hate me for this, but I literally call her. Like if I stub my toe, um, I don't hate you for this. <laughs> my boyfriend's like, why do you fucking call them so much? Like, um, my mom is my best friend today, but we've had to put in a lot of work to get there. Um, I've had to do a lot of work on myself. Um, and it's, it's hard, but, um, we got there and I wouldn't want it any other way. And I couldn't see it any other way. Okay. So some follow-up homework from today would be. List any problem behaviors you're currently dealing with uh, in your young adult child or behaviors that you anticipate. Pick one that you're ready to address and then brainstorm possible rewards or I don't really like the word punishment, so adverse contingencies that are doable, reasonable, and meaningful. Tell your adult child what the specific behavior, what specific behavior will result in added or loss of privileges, um, or, you know, if you're going to have to set new contingencies. And I'm really big on doing that in writing so that there's never any misunderstanding. You can't be accused of gaslighting and they can't gaslight you. And then monitor the behavior and honor the contingency consistently. If you're interested, feel free to do the homework and give an FSP a call and walk through your plan. Sometimes talking about it with someone else can help you anticipate any snags or bumps. All right. Thank you so much for your time and attention. If you'd like to join a group of parents who've been there and are not judgmental, you can stop by one of our support groups or you can book a time to talk one-on-one with a family support partner, or you could poke around our website and find some great resources, like a blog about how Liz supported Emmy using a lot of tough love strategies, but also that message of, I love you unconditionally, and even if. We also have a great tip sheet out there on supporting your partner. And of course, as a nonprofit, we'd appreciate it if you'd consider supporting our work, either by making a donation or sharing our resources with someone who you think can use them. Thanks so much for your time and attention.